Good morning. How's everybody doing this morning? Before we get started and before I forget, I'll do a tactical tip. One of the things that happens uh, when we were training with the Israelis and we were going through the women's self-defense portion, they had a drill where you had to go to a mall and you had to pick a woman out in the crowd. Now, I'm going to pick on women a little bit, but this is true of uh, men as well. But you had to pick a woman out in the mall and you had to follow her until she acknowledged you. Right? Right? And so everybody had to pick a woman. Now, one of our girls that we... I, I didn't go to the class. One of, we sent somebody. One of our girls followed a woman for, I think, nearly an hour or just over an hour where she was never noticed to the point it got to be where our girl got tired of doing this. And so what she did was is she actually ate with her. She, like, the lady was sitting here at a table right here. She ate right there. And then she got to where she went to the clothing racks and she would be on the other side of the clothing rack the whole time because she's tired of following this lady, right? So eventually the lady says, excuse me, do I know you? <laughs> All right? And then that was the cue that they explained what the drill was and thanked her. Now, the average for that during that class and the average on any class is it took about 30 minutes, it takes about 30 minutes during those classes average for somebody to notice that they're being followed, okay? Now, a bad guy is looking for two of three things before he's actually going to make an attack. He wants to catch you either isolated, he wants to catch you unaware, or he wants to catch you weak. If you're not paying attention to what's going on around you, he already has he already has the unawareness and so he just has to wait till one of those other times and since the majority of us seem to be become preoccupied with our telephones and things while we're out in public we're we're not paying attention to what's going on around us so i would encourage you not to be paranoid but once you walk outside of your house pay attention to your surroundings look around look at the people that you are you seeing the same person over and over again as you're walking around and if there's a problem Get, take away the isolation, find some place, go someplace um, uh, where there's more people and then bring attention to it, right? And sometimes you can call them out and say, hey, hey, Jim, what you, what you doing? What you, can I help you, sir? And just that, that shows that you're not weak. It shows that you're not underwear. And a lot of times it'll break that attack cycle. So instead of walking around with being on your phones and everything, if you're going to talk on the phone, Move your phone, and you're out in public, move your back to a wall, bring the phone up into here so that you have full peripheral vision rather than down here and pay attention. Then put the thing away and uh, go about your business, right? This is exactly what the Scripture says. All bad guys do is they do exactly what their, their boss tells them to do, the devil. He walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And so by, by all of your actions and by your awareness, you need to let him and all the people that work for him know you may not devour me. Amen? All right. Let's go, to, go with me once again to um, 1 John chapter 4 and verse 16. I give honor to Pastor Ron and his wife. Thank you so much for having me. And uh, we believe in you, and we're so grateful for your part in the body of Christ. That's a tremendous honor to have you in, in, our bo in the body. And obviously with J Pastors Jay and Kim, we're very, very grateful for them. They're close to us, and we, we uh, would do anything to help them. Um, here is, once again, it says, And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love, and he who abides in God abides in God. He who abides in God and God in him. Now here's the thing. There's a big, there's a shaking going on in the body of Christ. Uh, a lot of times people forget that um, the scripture says that all that can be shaken will be shaken, right? And we're seeing some of that. One of the big things that we're seeing is, is we're seeing people that, especially worship leaders in particular, but people throughout the body of Christ that are, are turning away from the Lord and they're saying things like, I don't even know whether God exists, I don't even believe that God exists. And normally what follows next is the statement that 
if God really exists with all the suffering that's going on in the world today, how could there truly be a good God if in all this suffering be taking place? If God is really love, and if God really cares about us, how is all this happening? And so generally people come to the conclusion that there is no God, and therefore they, they just leave, right? And then we have other people that are just angry at God because they know that there is a God and things are not going the way that he thinks they ought to do. And if God really loves me, then why is this happening to me? Why is this going on? And we ask questions like, why is there birth defects? We ask questions like, why, is, why these storms and all this destruction? And it's a valid question. And in me, because I, I spend a lot of time majoring on the love of God, I went before the Lord because I, this question needs to be answered. If you are love, now part of it is, is normally we say God is love and then we say God is in control. And if those two things are absolutely true, then there's a problem because all this stuff would have to at some point be His fault. Right? Okay, everybody's, you know, you, everybody's being quiet. Here's the thing, it, it's true. So what, what is the truth and why do bad things happen? And so I want to go through the Word today and explain to you exactly why that happens. So that you will know for yourself at 2 o'clock in the morning when you're seeking to believe God. But then also that if somebody says to you, well, if, if there really was a God, then why? Glad you asked. I got an answer for you. All right, go with me to uh, Genesis chapter 1. Listen, if I make you upset today, um, please don't leave it at Pastor Ron's account. Just go ahead and blame me. Write me an ugly letter. Leave him alone. I'm, I'm a big boy. I can take care of my own messes. All right? So uh, here in the beginning, it said, now remember in the beginning, verse 1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and the darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. It's good that you make your declarations. Uh, a lot of times people don't think about the fact that the Spirit of God was already hovering over the face of the deep and nothing was happening until the Word of God got spoken. And see, a lot of times people say, I don't understand why nothing's happening. Could be that the Spirit of God is hovering around your life, but nothing's being spoken. Moving right along. All right, so from that point, from that point what happens is, is God, oh, here, we got it right here. So what happens is, is this. Thank you, sir. You're going to have more water in your life than you've ever known. Um, what happens after that is for the next six days, God is creating things. And we talked about this the other day, but let's remember, He creates and then He looks and He says it is good. He creates, He looks, and it is everything is good. While God is in complete control, while God is, has dominion over the earth, while He's exercising over the earth, there is one quality about it that is stated over and over again, and that that quality is that everything is Okay, so the question becomes, how did we move from God being in complete control and His will being done perfectly in the earth and everything being good to the mess we've got today? Well, the answer can be found on day six. If you go with me to uh, um, Genesis 1.26. Then he says this. Now, this is, this is probably... He, he, had to, he created some stuff earlier in the morning in verse 25. And now it's the end. He's uh, the end of creation. And so he says, uh, Let us make God, man in our image according to our likeness. Now listen to what happens next. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over the earth, over all, the, or over all of the earth, over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in His own image, and in the image of God He created him. Male and female, He created them. Notice there, there are only two genders. Right? The guy who created everything is pretty clear about how this shakes out. There's only two. Right? And it, you know, it's funny because, I don't want to get too far off on this, but um, it's funny because people act like that when Jesus showed up, like the Old Testament no longer existed. 
And they say stuff like, well, Jesus never addressed gender. That's not true. He actually did. He actually says in Matthew, he says, um, he talk, when talking about marriage, he talks about that marriage is between a man and a woman. Right? But yet, it's like Jesus showed up and, and, and he would have said, oh yeah, I know dad created male and female in the beginning, but it's not like that anymore. I disagree with dad. That's hogwash. Jesus, Jesus did exactly, he, he was there in creation. He was there throughout all the Old Testament. He was there with the Father. He, he, we see His appearing. We see Him being utilized as the Word of God. They are one. They are never in disagreement. Anyway, moving on along. Let's, uh, so He goes on and He says, Male and female, He created them. Then God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Now, now who's going to subdue the earth? Yes. Man's going to subdue the earth. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over everything that lives, moves on the earth. Now, he said, and, I see, and, and God said, See, I have given you an herb, that every, every herb that yields seed, which is on the face of the earth, and every tree whose fruit yields seed, it shall be for you for food. Now, I don't want to get too far over into this, but I, I just want to encourage you in something. Um, there's two things that God gives man at the beginning of creation. He gives man dominion and he gives man seed. He gives man authority, he gives man seed. Now, a lot of times we don't think of things like this because when God begins to deal with us, a lot of times he begins to deal with us about sowing seed. It's not just about finances. It's about a lot of different things, okay? Pretty much the, the, over, the law that governs the earth, if you wanted to pick one law that pretty much governs everything, it is the law of seed time and harvest. To the point that salvation itself is based upon the law of seed time and harvest. Because Jesus himself is called that seed that brought us forth. That's, that's how important the law of seed time and harvest is. Now, a lot of times people get upset with the Lord because they're crying out for something and he says, so seed. You do understand that if right now, if I gave you a million acres and then I gave you one apple seed, that if you'll plant that seed today, you might not have a million acres by tonight. But in time, you will fill a million acres with apples if you will take the seed, plant it, water it, then when it comes up, harvest off of it, take some of that seed, reharvest it. And if you'll keep doing that, eventually you'll have a million acres of apples. In other words, whatever it is that God has put into your heart, it might look like there's no way this could possibly happen for me, but if you will continue to take your seed, whatever God puts into your hands, if you will continue to sow that seed, sow your gifting, sow your time, and then as that harvest comes, you sow again. And then you sow again. Eventually, you will get to even the million acres of apples off of one apple seed. And so God basically tells man, listen, and, and again, this is not my message, but he basically says, from this point forward, he says, hey, hey, Bubba, listen, if you like bananas, then you need to start planting some banana seed. Because everything that I've given to sustain you has a seed in it. So when you fight, find the stuff you like, if you want more of it, I'm not creating any more trees, Bubba. This is what's going to have to happen next. You're going to have to sow seed if you want some more trees. You have dominion now. Now, a lot of people don't like that. Wait, I don't, I'm going to stop there. Um, go with me to Psalms chapter 8. We'll start in verse 3. When I consider your heavens, the works of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you visit him? For you have made him a little lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor. You have made him to have dominion over all the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet. All sheep and oxen, every beast of the field, the birds of the air, the fish of the sea, that pass through the paths of the sea. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. Now, many of you for verse 5 are going to have a footnote right at the word angels, right? It says, God has made, you have made him a little lower than the angels, right? Most Bibles have like a little mark there. If you look it up, you'll find out that that word is not angels. 
In fact, it is the only time it was ever translated angels. That word there is God. You have made Him a little lower, basically, than yourself. Now, go with me to Psalm 115. In verse 16. The heavens, even the heavens, are the Lord's, but the earth He has given to the children of men. Anybody seeing a pattern here? All right. So, Psalm 115, 16. So, the question is, is if God is love and He loves us, which He does, and He wants to help us, why all this calamity? Why all of this destruction? Why are there birth defects? Why are there um, all these, this just destruction? Well, because on day six, something changed. On day six, God looked at man and says, okay, now, this planet, I'm giving you dominion over this planet. Now you have dominion. What happens here, you will be responsible for. Because now, you have dominion. So man, we don't know how long he did good. Um, might not have been too long. And then all of a sudden, he encounters the father's enemy and the father convinces the, the devil convinces him to yield to him now a lot of times women get blamed but the bible says that the woman that, that the, the man was right there with her you know he had dominion he could have at any point said listen you dumb snake you listen to me after everything god's done for us you need to get get out of here well, i'm not paying attention to you but instead he yields himself to it now um, Romans says that death entered the world, uh, uh, sin entered the world, and death through sin, and that it was one hundred percent the man's fault. Right? Some of you look at me like a calf at a new gate. It's Romans chapter five. So, so here's what happens: man has dominion, and then very, very quickly he takes his dominion and he submits it to the enemy of God, the devil himself. And then all of a sudden, death enters the world, and now creation enters into a downward spiral. I mean, to the point that at one point, every person on the earth, but like, what, eight? And we don't even know about the other. We just know really about Noah. They're all evil but them. That's how death is ruling and reigning. So when people say, and there was no sickness, there was no disease, until God gave man dominion, and then man subjugated his dominion to sin and death through the devil. So people say, well, why is there birth defects? Pretty simple. My granddaddy. My granddaddy did it. He yielded himself to the devil, and when he did, that sin entered the world and death through sin. Didn't have anything to do with God. Had to do with my granddaddy. My granddaddy did that. He made a very bad choice one day, and that's why we're in the condition that we're in. Because he had the right to make the choice because he'd been given dominion. Father didn't do this. In fact, while the father was in control, there was none of this. It wasn't until dominion was given to men. Now, see, a lot of times people just don't like this. We want to blame God for this, and I'm not sure why. But this is our granddaddy's fault. This is the day that, that man made a choice to follow after the devil rather than follow after God. Unfortunately, he was the guy that was in charge of everything, so we all got thrown in with it. Now, you can see this going on. I want to show you a couple things. Because people, people want, and it's gotten worse in society today, everybody wants to become a victim. Right? I want to blame somebody else for what's going on in my life. And see, we're acting like this is something new, but really church people have been doing this for years. The misery is in, in my life is not, is not my fault. It's God's fault. Somehow He's withholding from me. It's not His will that I have this. It's not His will that this happened to me. When a lot of times it's because we have actually failed to operate in the dominion that God has given us. Especially after it was restored to us through the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Now here, I, you don't have to take my word for it. Go with me to um, uh, Exodus 14, verse 20. Now he's, um, excuse me, not verse 20. Go, go up a little bit. So they've got, the Israel, they've got the Egyptians breathing down their neck, verse 13. And it says, Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which He will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see, you shall see no more. The Lord will fight uh, for you and hold your peace. Now that sounds like a pretty good faith declaration, doesn't it? But there's a problem. Because he's talking about what the Lord's going to do. And the Lord's about to talk to him about what you're going to do. Because the next verse, God speaks to him and says, the Lord said to Moses, why do you cry to me? I don't know. I, I, I could think of a pretty good reason to cry to him because i got an army right there. And like Pastor Jay, would, there's fire and arrows at us. I can think of a reason to cry out. So why is God looking at his man saying, what are you crying out to me for? What are you yelling at me for? I thought God was in control. I thought God was the one that had dominion. And if God wanted this to happen, it would just happen. And yet God says to his man, he says, why do you cry to me? I've already given you everything you need. That rod that's in your hand, stretch forth that rod. That rod is still the rod of God. I've already, you don't need to cry to me anymore. I didn't tell you to stop when you got to this sea. You're the ones that decided to stop. You let the sea affect you more than you let my promise affect you. Why'd you stop? But you don't have to cry to me. You don't need anything from me because I've already given you everything you need. Boy, you have dominion. Take that rod and raise it up. Why do you cry to me? Now, let's look at, let me ask you this, just for because we're going to run out of time pretty quick. What about Joshua speaking to the sun? Commanding the sun and the moon to stand still. How'd that happen? How did a man speak to the sun and the moon and command it to stand still? And God, there's no indication in there at all that God told him to do that. He just did it. He, he did, I, I, I like to win. I, I like that attitude. I like to win. And uh, let's, there's no reason. If we can win right now, there's no reason to wait until tomorrow. I like to win. Let's just keep this going. One of my favorite stories in American history is when uh, Benjamin Franklin was meeting with uh, the ambassadors from England and, um, the, and, and France. And they were giving toasts. And the ambassador from England says, I lift up whatever king was king at the time. He goes, he, who is like the sun? Hear, hear. And uh, the French president, the French ambassador says, I lift up our king who is like the moon. Hear, hear. Benjamin Franklin said, I lift up President Washington who like Joshua told the sun and moon to stand still and they did. <laughs> <laughs> Another quick question. Who dictated the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah? Was it God? Or was it a man named Abraham? Who began to negotiate? Now, a lot of times people are wondering why, why was God going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah? And I'm not talking necessarily about the sin, but if, if man has dominion, how does God end up uh, destroying Sodom and Gomorrah? If you go back and it says that people were crying out to him. They were, giving him, they were giving him the right to come in. We need help, God. And he's about to show up and he's about to help. He's about to answer those cries. But then he says, should I hide this from my man Abraham, seeing that we're in relationship together? And then what happens? The man starts talking to him. He says, now listen, Lord. Eh, be it far from you, Lord. And he starts talking the God of all creation. Are you really going to do this if there's 50? What about 40? Come on, Lord. How does this happen? Because man had been given dominion on day six. And man had pulled with God. 
and they would talk together. All right. Go with me to uh, Matthew 13. Excuse me, Matthew 3, verse 13. Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. And John tried to prevent him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and you are coming to me. And Jesus answered and said, Permit it be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he allowed him. That's interesting. God in the flesh is asking a man for permission to be baptized. Permit this be so. Allow this. In fact, that's how it says it later. It says, allowed him. Why didn't he just come in and say, just do what I tell you. I'm God, you're not. Do what I tell you. Because, God, because he's asking him, will you permit this? That we fulfill all righteousness? Go with me to, um, let's go with uh, Matthew chapter 8. We've talked a little bit about this. With a centurion, Matthew 8. And he talks here, he says, um, verse 5, he says, Now when Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him pleading with him, saying, Lord, my servant is lying at home paralyzed, dreadfully tormented. Jesus said, I will come and heal him. The centurion answered, said, Lord, I'm not worthy that you should come in under his, my roof. Only speak a word and my servant will be healed. What just happened? A man just told Jesus, no, you're not coming to my house. I'm not worthy. Even though Jesus evidently thought he was worthy. He stopped when they told him to. This wasn't the only time Jesus would stop. Do you remember when uh, he delivered the man of Gadara? Right? He gets done delivering the madman of Gadara, and instead of people coming out going, Thank you. You're finally getting rid of the crazy naked fella. Thank you. Man, I haven't slept at all. That dude breaks chains, starts. Sc- Listen, I would, I would have not only given an offering, I would have taken over, I would have fed his staff. To, I'm finally going to get to sleep. Thank you, Jesus. This crazy naked fella's been just driving us nuts. We chain him and he breaks it. And he screams all night. It's crazy. And you think that would be, but that's not what happened. The people come down and it says they begged him to leave. Funny thing, he did. Do you really think he crossed that sea just to walk over there for one guy? He's headed to the Decapolis. He wants to do this. He's going to do what he's always been doing. But the people come to him and say, no, we don't want you here. You need to go. And what did he do? He went. He didn't say, I'm the God of all creation. Listen, I, you know, I, I'm God in the flesh. I'm the king of kings and I'm the Lord of lords. Don't you tell me where I can and cannot go. I got another question for you. If that's the way God approaches stuff, why when he walks up to the man at the pool of Bethesda, why does he ask the question, will you be made whole? Why doesn't he just do it? I mean, that's the way religion paints him, right? He can do whatever he wants. What, will you, will, what do you, and it wasn't the only time, he'd ask a blind guy, what do you want me to do for you? I don't know, I think it would be pretty clear by him stumbling up here, Jesus. Here's another question, a little bit harder for you. How is it that a woman can touch the hem of his garment? He has no idea who she is, and yet the power of God flows out of him and heals her. And he didn't even know who she was. It says says that when he turned around, he said he asked everyone, and it says when all denied it, even her. It's like, what me? What me? Not me. I I don't know what you're talking about. Coincidentally, did you notice he didn't take his healing away from her because she lied? How is it that a woman can have faith in him and by no act, overt act of his own will, power flows out of him and restores her completely? 
Somebody touch me, for I perceive power flowing out of me. How is that possible? Because he is always ready to help. And if you will connect, and if you will trust, and if you will yield to him, the power flows. You are not the, he is not the one that's deciding whether the power flows. We are. Now, you ask this question, go with me to Hebrews chapter 11. We want to look in verse 30. By faith the walls of Jericho fell down after they were encircled for seven days. By faith the harlot Rahab did not perish with those who do not believe when she had received the spies with, uh, with peace. What more shall I say for time would fail me to tell of Gideon, of Barak, of Samson, of Jephthah, also of David, of Samuel and the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, became valiant in battle, turned the flight of armies of aliens, women received their dead, raised to life. Now let's just stop there. You should go through that list and realize what you're capable of. I wasn't valiant before, but now by faith I can become valiant in battle. I can quench the violence of fire. By faith in God, this is what happens. This is what I can expect in my personal life. But then he, he explains something. He said, women receive their dead raised again. Others, now notice this, were tortured not accepting deliverance. Which means that deliverance was available and that he wanted to do it, but they would not accept it. Not accepting deliverance. Now there was a reason. He says. Um, hold on just a second. I lost my place. He says uh, still others. Uh, not accepting deliverance. That they might obtain a better resurrection. Still others had trials of mockings. Of scourgings. Yes of chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were tempted. They were slain by the sword. The wandered in the sheepskins Of goatskins being destitute. Afflicted, tormented, of whom, now notice this, this is God's testimony to these people, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in the deserts and the mountains and dens and caves of the earth. All of these, having obtained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise. God having provided something better for us that we should not, that they should not be made perfect apart from us. So, Deliverance was available, but they wouldn't receive it because they wanted something else. Now, I just have to be honest. Maybe I'm a bit of a wimp, but um, I am not in this camp. I, I don't need a better resurrection. Just any, other, any resurrection will do for me. And so I'm planning on living. If they, come and get, if they come and get me, then they're the ones, the army showing up to deliver me. I'm going to go ahead and just receive deliverance because after that encounter, then I'll go somewhere else preach the gospel again, and if they attack me, I'll receive deliverance. I got things to do. Now, here's the thing. God says the world was not worthy of these people. Because a lot of times we have in our religious minds, if we were just worthy, then we would receive from God. Well, these people were worthy, and they didn't receive from God. People think that the will of God is automatically done in the earth. And I don't understand how they believe that based upon Scripture. God's will has not been done from the beginning. How many of you know the warning that Adam got? Don't eat that tree. I, what, what's the implication? I don't want you to eat of that tree, boy. I don't want you to die. What happened? He eats the tree, and the boy dies. What about when God uh, wanted to take those people that came out of Egypt? Those people. It was those people that were supposed to go into the promised land. How many of you remember how many of those people that God wanted to take into the promised land? How many of you remember how many of those people actually went into the promised land? When God showed up at Sodom and Gomorrah, to deliver Lot. How many people did God want to deliver? Of Lot's family, right? How many, do you remember? 
It's him, his wife, his two daughters, and their crazy husbands. Right? How many got delivered? So God wanted to deliver six. How many was He able to free? No, He didn't. He only delivered. He only delivered a lot. The only people that got delivered was Lot and his two daughters. The water turns into salt. I mean, excuse me. The, di- the wife turns into salt. And the two boys, they, they were crazy anyway. Right? And so they don't even get, they, they don't even make it out of town. But I thought, I thought if it was the will of God, it would just happen. How come all six aren't out? Why is it Jesus says to Jerusalem, Oh Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how much, how often I wanted to gather you as a, chin, as a hen gathers her chicks, but you would not allow it. Here's another one for you. Paul's very clear. It is God's will that all men be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. I've met some lost people. How about you? I've been to funerals of people I know for a fact were headed to hell because they had rejected God. How about you? I thought God's will was automatically done. No. You have the right to reject. You have the right to reject the plan of God. Now, you can, there's a couple ways you can do it. One, you can do it because you want something. Hey, I'm, I'm rejecting my deliverance because I want a better resurrection. Knock yourself out. I'm rejecting deliverance because I do not know how to receive it. I'm rejecting deliverance because that's not in line with what I believe. The Pharisees were full of this. They had the Savior standing right there in front of them. And they're rejecting freedom because it doesn't line up with the way they think it should look like. What about Jesus at his own hometown? Where he goes down there and it's very clear what it says. It says, not that he would not do any mighty works. It says there he could not do any mighty works because of their unbelief. So what's another way that you won't receive your deliverance? Even with Jesus standing there physically offering it. Unbelief. I will not believe. I don't believe that. So, when somebody asks me, if God is love, then tell me why babies have birth defects. My granddaddy. My granddaddy made a really bad choice, and that's how we ended up in this mess. But my father, my father came forward with a Savior that can undo everything my granddaddy did. But I have to learn how to accept deliverance. I have to learn how to walk by faith. I have to learn how to cooperate with the Lord. But He is not to blame. Over and over again, we can see Him stretching out His hand to help and people slapping it aside. And We don't have to go to the Bible because I can testify that I've done it. I remember, and, I, and I've got to close, I'm out of time. I, now, I teach healing school. We've got healing school coming up at the end of April, I believe, right? You're welcome to come to Florida where it's warmer and, uh, and enjoy healing school. Now, I've taught healing. I got saved because I was sick and dying. I got, I'd gotten into a fight with a street gang out in front of a pool hall. And so my mother knew something was wrong. I'd never hurt that many people before out in front of God and everybody. And... Um, she knew something was wrong. She, she wanted me to get checked out, and there was a bunch going on. And I, it turns out that I was making bad decisions because I had a condition called ciliatic sprue that was affecting my brain, and I, did, I didn't have real good cause and effect relationships. Um, th- there's, a, there's a story to it, but I'm not going to get into it because I'm out of time. So that was in uh, January of 1989. Um, by... August of that year, I was completely healed of that which is incurable. God, God had already done some things in my, my life. I damaged my spinal cord that February, no, excuse me, that December. Got healed of that. And so, I, I've been healed. I, well, just so you know, they told me in February, 
February, right? February of last year that I'd broken my back. I'd, I'd damaged my spinal, I'd, I'd fractured my L4 and L5 vertebrae. And uh, they told me that um, uh, I had to t- have three MRIs. I don't understand why they, I couldn't do them all at one time, but I had to go back three times, okay? And they told me that I was going to be basically incapacitated for six months. I mean, I could move around, but it wasn't comfy. And so, take the first MRI, they get that look at it. They take the second MRI, they get that look at it. By the third MRI, I was completely healed within a three-week period. period. Because God is exactly who He says He is. There's nothing special about me. But I say that because I believe in healing. Well, it was 1993, I think. I was in the Meadowlands. I'm getting ready to go to a meeting. I'm coming down in an elevator. I just met with a doctor before I went to, that's in New Jersey, but I, the first time I'd just gone to a doctor. Um, now, by this time, I've actually probably got a 12 tape series on healing. And so, uh, and I'm talking about the hour, the 90 minute tapes, not the 60 minute tapes. I've taught on healing a lot. I'm at the time, I am, um, my ex wife had already had her first affair. I, and um, there was a lot going on in the ministry, and I just hated life. And I, I did not like the ministry, and I just didn't want me to be here anymore. And so I'd gone into a doctor, he told me that I'd been having some weird things with my heart, and he says to me, you have, um, I think it was, H, I, if I, I might get this wrong, but atrial ventricular fibrillation. And he says, um, basically what's going to happen is, he says, you need to get ready to go. We really can't, there's not a whole lot we can do. We can give you some stuff to kind of mitigate it. But basically, in a pretty short period of time, your heart's just going to begin to beat faster, 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 and faster, and then eventually it's just going to bust. There's some stuff you can do to slow it down a little bit, but, but basically, and they, they were, it was going to be pretty quick. They said it was going to be six months to a year. And um, so I said, okay. So I'm going down in the elevator. Now, I've, remember, I've got a 12-tape series on healing. I'm, I've taught healing. I've been healed multiple times. I'm going down in the elevator, and the Lord says, um, you haven't talked to me about your heart. And I said, yep, I haven't. And he said, you're going to die soon. I said, I know it. And he said, um, well, uh, you haven't talked to me about it. And I said, that's right, and I'm not going to either. I said, I'm leaving. I'm out of here. I said, I'm waiting for it to go. I don't like the ministry. I don't like the pain that I'm in over this, 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 tra- this infidelity. I, I'm, I'm gone. And um, the, the Lord says to me, he goes, you know, I've never forsaken you in anything. I'm really surprised you forsake me. And I began to weep, and I said, God, I'm sorry. I've been majoring on everything that's wrong rather than what's right. And I said, Father, right here, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, I receive my healing of my heart condition, and I command my heart to be completely normal now in the name of Jesus. Heart, you listen to me. I'm talking to you. Atrial ventricular fibrillation, you're a thing of the past. I'll no longer have you. From that day to this, I've never had another heart problem. Interesting thing, though, having a 12-tape series, sooner or later, they would have found me dead somewhere. And everybody would have thought, see, healing doesn't belong today because he taught healing, and look, now he's dead. And they would have said, see, God doesn't heal. But the thing of it was, it wasn't God at all. It was me. It was me. And you will find out that that is always true. Now, I don't know everything. So if you come up to me and you tell me about some situation, I don't know everything. But I I do not allow what I don't know to change what I do know. And I do know that himself bore our sicknesses and carried our pains. I do know that by his stripes we were healed. I do know that one of the benefits of serving God is healing. 
And so I might not be able to explain everything. But I do start with, Father, you are not my problem. Because when you were in complete control of the earth, everything was good. And it wasn't until day six, about midday, when you turned it over to us that things started going downhill. So, Lord, you are not the author of my problem. Sir, you are the author of the solution to my problem. And so when people say, well, if God is such a good God, why do these things happen? Look at my family. It was my granddaddy. You don't have to look at him. Look at my granddaddy. People say, well, the devil. The devil wouldn't have had a prayer if the man would have stood up and used the dominion he had. The devil still doesn't have a prayer if you'll stand up and use the dominion you have. It says he's, you've been brought to naught. But, you know, we still, we're still learning some things. I'm still learning some things. You know, I don't know how my back got broke. And I don't know why it took three weeks. I have no idea. Now, I'm very, very grateful that I'm where I'm at today. I can tell you that during that three weeks, not one part of it was the Lord. That I had to spend some time, at, I had to spend some time doing these things, doing what I knew to do, feeding on the Word of God, not to earn it. I, at, at no point, now, and see, that's what I think is part of the problem with people, is people are trying to earn healing. No, you receive healing. Healing has already been purchased. There's nothing to earn. It's already been bought. You are, you are like an occupying force serving notice on the forces of darkness. You no longer have authority here. Because I've received Jesus, and through His name, and through His authority, through His righteousness, my righteousness is of Him. He said so. But it's not my Father who did all these things. It's not my Jesus who did these things to people. It is not my Jesus that permitted birth defects. It is not my Jesus that permitted these things. It was the man that He gave dominion over the planet to. But then you can stand up today because of Jesus and say, I am exempt now. You no longer have a right to me. I have been translated out of the kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of God's dear son. We just had a bunch of partners that got delivered went during the hurricanes in Florida when they hit that massive hurricane. We had people that were right in the middle of it that stood out there because we were calling our partners before it hit. And they stood out there and they walked their property and they spoke to their property and said, listen, it doesn't matter what goes on in this earth. You don't have the right to touch my property. I belong to God and I've got authority through the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that storm, they, they didn't have any damage at all. Now, I know everybody can come up and tell, give me anecdotes of, well, this, well, that. Folks, I'm not going to debate anecdotes with you because the word of God is true. And I might not know why, why in your situation. But I do know a fellow that does. And if you will talk to him, he is not afraid of questions to explain to you. He will answer you. But I do know who it wasn't. I do know who didn't cause your problem. And until we get a solidifier in our own faith that God is not my problem, and when I lift up my voice, He is right there ready to help me. That you're not my issue. You are not my problem. You are the solution to my problem. Lord, teach me. Teach me how to receive my deliverance. Because you could be one person of whom the world was not worthy. And you can still die if you do not know how to receive deliverance. And it will not be the will of God. It will be our own ignorance because we are perishing for a lack of knowledge. Again, if I've said something that's upset you, write me an ugly letter, leave your pastor alone. <laughs> I can handle it. But we need to, the quicker we can get over to ourselves that God didn't do this to us, that from the beginning He only wanted good for us, but we have a part to play. We have dominion here. He gave those things. And we begin to talk to him about how to utilize this dominion correctly. A lot of times people are utilizing their dominion. You know, uh, the young lady, I apologize, I don't know your name. She's talking about how from Proverbs 18, 20 or 22, death and life are in the power of the tongue. And those who love it will eat its fruit. You know, people are utilizing the power of the tongue. They're just using it for death. They're utilizing their dominion. 
They're just speaking completely contrary to what the Father has said. But folks, you can go home today knowing for a fact when I talk to the Lord, I'm not talking to somebody that I have to convince to help me. And whatever's gone wrong, he didn't do it, but he can tell me how to get out of it. Amen? Amen? Amen. Pastor. Pastor.